Section four of Tales of the Fish Patrol by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Section four The Siege of the Lancashire Queen. Possibly our most exasperating experience on the Fish Patrol was when Charlie Le Grant and I laid a two week siege to a big four masted English ship. Before we had finished with the affair, it became a pretty mathematical problem, and it was by the merest chance that we came into possession of the instrument that brought it to a successful termination. After our raid on the oyster pirates, we had returned to Oakland, where two more weeks passed before Neil Partington's wife was out of danger and on the high road to recovery. So it was after an absence of a month, all told, that we turned the reindeer's nose toward Benicia. When the cat's away, the mice will play, and in these four weeks the fishermen had become very bold in violating the law. When we passed Point Pedro, we noticed many signs of activity among the shrimp catchers, and, well into San Pablo Bay, we observed a widely scattered fleet of upper bay fishing boats hastily pulling in their nets and getting up sail. This was suspicious enough to warrant investigation and the first and only boat we succeeded in boarding proved to have an illegal net the law permitted no smaller mesh for catching shad than one that measured seven and one-half inches inside the knots while the mesh of this particular net measured only three inches it was a flagrant breach of the rules and the two fishermen were forthwith put under arrest neil partington took one of them with him to help manage the reindeer while Charlie and I went on ahead with the other in the captured boat. But the shad fleet had shedded over toward the Petaluma shore in wild flight, and for the rest of the run through San Pablo Bay we saw no more fishermen at all. Our prisoner, a bronzed and bearded Greek, sat sullenly on his net while we sailed his craft. It was a new Columbia River salmon boat, evidently on its first trip, and it handled splendidly even when charlie praised it our prisoner refused to speak or to notice us and we soon gave him up as a most unsociable fellow we ran up the carcanez straits and edged into the bight at turner's shipyard for smoother water here were lying several english steel sailing ships waiting for the wheat harvest and here most unexpectedly in the precise place where we had captured big alec we came upon two Italians in a skiff that was loaded with a complete Chinese sturgeon line. The surprise was mutual, and we were on top of them before either they or we were aware. Charlie had barely time to luff into the wind and run up to them. I ran forward and tossed them a line with orders to make it fast. One of the Italians took a turn with it over a cleat, while I hastened to lower our big spritsail this accomplished the salmon boat dropped astern dragging heavily on the skiff charlie came forward to board the prize but when i proceeded to haul alongside by means of the line the italians cast it off we at once began drifting to leeward while they got out two pairs of oars and rowed their light craft directly into the wind this maneuver for the moment disconcerted us for in our large and heavily loaded boat we could not expect to catch them with the oars but our prisoner came unexpectedly to our aid. His black eyes were flashing eagerly, and his face was flushed with suppressed excitement as he dropped the centerboard, sprang forward with a single leap, and put up the sail. "'I've always heard that Greeks don't like Italians,' Charlie laughed as he ran aft to the tiller. "'And never in my experience have I seen a man so anxious for the capture of another, as was our prisoner in the chase that followed.' His eyes fairly snapped, and his nostrils quivered and dilated in a most extraordinary way. Charlie steered while he tended the sheet, and though Charlie was as quick and alert as a cat, the Greek could hardly control his impatience. The Italians were cut off from the shore, which was fully a mile away at its nearest point. Did they attempt to make it, we could haul after them with the wind abeam and overtake them before they had covered an eighth of the distance. But they were too wise to attempt it contenting themselves with rowing lustily to windward along the starboard side of the big ship the big lancashire queen but beyond the ship lay an open stretch of fully two miles to the shore in that direction this also they dared not attempt for we were bound to catch them before they could cover it so when they reached the bow of the lancashire queen nothing remained but to pass around and row down her port side toward the stern 
which meant rowing to leeward and giving us the advantage we in the salmon boat sailing close on the wind tacked about and crossed the ship's bow then charlie put up the tiller and headed down the port side of the ship the greek letting out the sheet and grinning with delight the italians were already half down the ship's length but the stiff breeze at our back drove us after them far faster than they could row closer and closer we came and i lying down forward was just reaching out to grasp the skiff when it ducked under the great stern of the lancashire queen the chase was virtually where it had begun the italians were rowing up the starboard side of the ship and we were hauled close on the wind and slowly edging out from the ship as we worked to windward then they darted around her bow and began to row down her port side and we tacked about crossing her bow and went plunging down the wind hot after them and again just as i was reaching for the skiff it ducked under the ship's stern and out of danger and so it went around and around the skiff each time just barely ducking into safety by this time the ship's crew had become aware of what was taking place and we could see their heads in a long row as they looked at us over the bulwarks each time we missed the skiff at the stern they set up a wild cheer and dashed across to the other side of the lancashire queen to see the chase to windward they showered us and the italians with jokes and advice and made our greek so angry that at least once on each circuit he raised his fist and shook it at them in a rage they came to look for this and at each display greeted it with uproarious mirth what a circus cried one pork about your marine hippodromes if this ain't one i'd like to know affirmed another six days go as you please announced a third who says the dagos won't win on the next tack to windward the greek offered to change places with charlie let me sail at the boat he demanded i fix a them i catch a them sure this was a stroke at charlie's professional pride for pride himself he did upon his boat sailing abilities but he yielded the tiller to the prisoner and took his place at the sheet three times again we made the circuit and the greek found that he could get no more speed out of the salmon boat than charlie had better give it up one of the sailors advised from above the greek scowled ferociously and shook his fist in his customary fashion in the meanwhile my mind had not been idle and i had finally involved an idea keep going charlie one more time i said and as we laid out on the next tack to windward i bent a piece of line to a small grappling hook i had seen lying in the bale hole the end of the line i made fast to the ring bolt in the bow and with the hook out of sight i waited for the next opportunity to use it once more they made their leeward pull down the port side of the lancashire queen and more once we churned down after them before the wind nearer and nearer we drew and i was making believe to reach for them as before the stern of the skiff was not six feet away and they were laughing at me derisively as they ducked under the ship's stern at that instant i suddenly arose and threw the grappling iron it caught fairly and squarely on the rail of the skiff which was jerked backward out of safety as the rope tautened and the salmon boat ploughed on a groan went up from the row of sailors above which quickly changed to a cheer as one of the italians whipped out a long sheath knife and cut the rope but we had drawn them out of safety and charlie from his place in the stern sheets reached over and clutched the stern of the skiff the whole thing happened in a second of time for the first italian was cutting the rope and charlie was clutching the skiff when the second italian dealt him a rap over the head with an oar charlie released his hold and collapsed stunned into the bottom of the salmon boat and the italians bent their oars and escaped back under the ship's stern the greek took both tiller and sheet and continued the chase around the lancashire queen while i attended to charlie on whose head a nasty lump was rapidly rising our sailor audience was wild with delight and to a man encouraged the fleeing italians charlie sat up with one hand on his head and gazed about him sheepishly it will never do to let them escape now he said at the same time drawing his revolver on our next circuit he threatened the italians with the weapon but they rode on stolidly keeping splendid stroke and utterly disregarding him if you don't stop i'll shoot charlie said menacingly but this had no effect nor were they to be frightened into surrendering even when he fired several shots dangerously close to them it was too much to expect him to shoot unarmed men and this they knew as well as we did so they continued to pull doggedly round and round the ship we'll run them down then charlie exclaimed 
We'll wear them out and win them. So the chase continued. Twenty times more we ran them around the Lancashire Queen, and at last we could see that even their iron muscles were giving out. They were nearly exhausted, and it was only a matter of a few more circuits when the game took on a new feature. On the road to windward they always gained on us, so that they were halfway down the ship's side on the row to leeward when we were passing the bow. But this last time, as we passed the bow, we saw them escaping up the ship's gangway, which had been suddenly lowered. It was an organized move on the part of the sailors, evidently countenanced by the captain. For by the time we arrived where the gangway had been, it was being hoisted up, and the skiff, slung in the ship's davits, was likewise flying aloft out of reach. The parley that followed with the captain was short and snappy. He absolutely forbade us to board the Lancashire Queen, and has absolutely refused to give up the two men. By this time Charlie was as enraged as the Greek. Not only had he been foiled in a long and ridiculous chase, but he had been knocked senseless into the bottom of his boat by the men who had escaped him. "'Knock off my head with little apples,' he declared emphatically, striking the fist of one hand into the palm of the other. "'If those two men ever escape me, I'll stay here to get them if it takes the rest of my natural life, and if I don't get them, then I promise you I'll live unnaturally long, or until I do get them, or my name's not Charlie Legrand. And then began the siege of the Lancashire Queen, a siege memorable in the annals of both fishermen and fish patrol. When the reindeer came along, after a fruitless pursuit of the shad fleet, Charlie instructed Neil Partington to send out his own salmon boat, with blankets, provisions, and a fisherman's charcoal stove. By sunset this exchange of boats was made, and we said good-bye to our Greek, who perforce had to go into Benicia and be locked up for his own violation of the law. After supper, Charlie and I kept alternate four-hour watches till daylight. The fisherman made no attempt to escape that night, though the ship sent out a boat for scouting purposes to find if the coast were clear. By the next day we saw that a steady siege was in order, and we perfected our plans with an eye to our own comfort. A dock, known as the Solano Wharf, which ran out from the Benicia shore, helped us in this. It happened that the Lancashire Queen, the shore at Turner's shipyard, and the Solano Wharf were the corners of a big equilateral triangle. From ship to shore, the side of the triangle along which the Italians had to escape was a distance equal to that from the Solano Wharf to the shore, the side of the triangle along which we had to travel to get to the shore before the Italians. But as we could sail much faster than they could row, we could permit them to travel about half their side of the triangle before we darted out along our side. If we allowed them to get more than halfway, they were certain to beat us to shore while if we started before they were halfway, they were equally certain to beat us back to the ship. We found that an imaginary line drawn from the end of the wharf to a windmill farther along the shore cut precisely in half the line of the triangle along which the Italians must escape to reach the land. This line made it easy for us to determine how far to let them run away before we bestirred ourselves in pursuit. Day after day we would watch them through our glasses as they rode leisurely along toward the halfway point, and as they drew close into line with the windmill, we would leap into the boat and get up sail. At sight of our preparation, they would turn and row slowly back to the Lancashire Queen, secure in the knowledge that we could not overtake them. To guard against calms, when our salmon boat would be useless, we also had in readiness a light rowing skiff equipped with spoon oars. But at such times, when the wind failed us, we were forced to row out from the wharf as soon as they rowed from the ship. In the night time, on the other hand, we were compelled to patrol the immediate vicinity of the ship, which we did. Charlie and I, standing four-hour watches, turn and turn about. The Italians, however, preferred the daytime in which to escape, and so our long night vigils were without result. "'What makes me mad,' said Charlie, "'is our being kept from our honest beds "'while those rascally lawbreakers are sleeping soundly every night. "'But much good may it do them,' he threatened. "'I'll keep them on that ship till the captain charges them board, "'as sure as a sturgeon's not a catfish.' "'It was a tantalizing problem that confronted us. "'As long as we were vigilant, they could not escape, "'and as long as they were careful, we would be unable to catch them.' Charlie cudgelled his brains continually, but for once his imagination failed him. It was a problem, apparently, without other solution than that of patience. 
It was a waiting game, and whichever waited the longer was bound to win. To add to our irritation, friends of the Italians established a code of signals with them from the shore, so that we never dared to relax the siege for a moment. And besides this, there were always one or two suspicious-looking fishermen hanging around the Solano Wharf and keeping watch on our actions. We could do nothing but grin and bear it, as Charlie said, while it took up all our time and prevented us from doing other work. The days went by, and there was no change in the situation. Not that no attempts were made to change it. One night, friends from the shore came out in a skiff and attempted to confuse us while the two Italians escaped. That they did not succeed was due to the lack of a little oil on the ship's davits, for we were drawn back from the pursuit of the strange boat by the creaking of the davits, and arrived at the Lancashire Queen just as the Italians were lowering their skiff. Another night, fully half a dozen skiffs rowed around us in the darkness, but we held on like a leech to the side of the ship and frustrated their plan till they grew angry and showered us with abuse. Charlie laughed to himself in the bottom of the boat. "'It's a good sign, lad,' he said to me. "'When men begin to abuse, make sure they're losing patience. And shortly after they lose patience, they lose their heads. Mark my words, if we only hold out, they'll get careless, and some fine day, then we'll get them.' But they did not grow careless, and Charlie confessed that this was one of the times when all signs failed. Their patience seemed equal to ours, and the second week of the siege dragged monotonously along. Then Charlie's lagging imagination quickened sufficiently to suggest a ruse. Peter Boylan, a new patrolman, and one unknown to the fisherfolk, happened to arrive in Venetia, and we took him into our plan. We were as secret as possible about it, but in some unfathomable way the friends ashore got word to the beleaguered Italians to keep their eyes open. On the night we were to put our ruse into effect, Charlie and I took up our usual station in our rowing skiff alongside the Lancashire Queen. After it was thoroughly dark, Peter Boylan came out in a crazy duck boat, the kind you can pick up and carry away under one arm. When we heard him coming along, paddling noisily, we slipped away a short distance into the darkness and rested our oars. Opposite the gangway, having jovially hailed the anchor watch of the Lancashire Queen, and asked the direction of the Scottish Chiefs, another wheat ship, he awkwardly capsized himself. The man who was standing the anchor watch ran down to the gangway and hauled him out of the water. This was what we wanted, to get aboard the ship and the next thing he expected was to be taken on deck and then below to warm up and dry out. But the captain inhospitably kept him perched on the lowest gangway step, shivering miserably and with his feet dangling in the water, till we, out of very pity, rode in from the darkness and took him off. The jokes and jibes of the awakened crew sounded anything but sweet in our ears, and even the two Italians climbed up on the rail and laughed down at us long and maliciously. "'That's all right,' Charlie said in a low voice, which I only could hear. "'I'm mighty glad it's not us that's laughing first. "'We'll save our laugh to the end, eh, lad?' He clapped a hand on my shoulder as he finished, but it seemed to me that there was more determination than hope in his voice. It would have been possible for us to secure the aid of United States Marshals and board the English ship backed by government authority. But the instructions of the fish commission were to the effect that the patrolmen should avoid complications, and this one, did we call on the higher powers, might well end in a pretty international tangle. The second week of the siege grew to its close, and there was no sign of change in the situation. On the morning of the fourteenth day the change came, and it came in a guise as unexpected and startling to us as it was to the men we were striving to capture. Charlie and I, after our customary night vigil by the side of the Lancashire Queen, rode into the Solano Wharf. "'Hello!' cried Charlie in surprise. "'In the name of reason and common sense, what is that? Of all unmannerly craft, did you ever see the like?' Well might he exclaim, for there, tied up to the dock, lay the strangest-looking launch I had ever seen. Not that it could be called a launch, either, but it seemed to resemble a launch more than any other kind of boat. It was seventy feet long, but so narrow was it, and so bare of superstructure, that it appeared much smaller than it really was. It was built wholly of steel, and was painted black. Three smokestacks, a good distance apart, and raking well aft, arose in single file amidships, while the bow, long and lean and sharp as a knife, plainly advertised that the boat was made for speed. 
Passing under the stern, we read Streak, painted in small white letters. Charlie and I were consumed with curiosity. In a few minutes we were on board and talking with an engineer who was watching the sunrise from the deck. He was quite willing to satisfy our curiosity, and in a few minutes we learned that the streak had come in after dark from San Francisco, that this was what might be called the trial trip, that she was the property of Silas Tate, a young mining millionaire of California whose fad was high-speed yachts. There was some talk about turbine engines, direct application of steam, and the absence of pistons, rods, and cranks, all of which was beyond me, for I was familiar only with sailing craft, but I did understand the last words of the engineer. Four thousand horsepower and forty-five miles an hour, though you wouldn't think it, he concluded proudly. Say it again, man, say it again, Charlie exclaimed in an excited voice. Four thousand horsepower and forty-five miles an hour, the engineer repeated, grinning good-naturedly. "'Where's the owner?' was Charlie's next question. "'Is there any way I can speak to him?' The engineer shook his head. "'No, I'm afraid not. He's asleep, you see.' At that moment a young man in blue uniform came on deck farther aft and stood regarding the sunrise. "'There he is. That's him. That's Mr. Tate,' said the engineer. Charlie walked aft and spoke to him, and while he talked earnestly, the young man listened with an amused expression on his face. He must have inquired about the depth of water close into the shore at Turner's shipyard, for I could see Charlie making gestures and explaining. A few minutes later he came back in high glee. "'Come on, lad,' he said. "'On to the dock with you. We've got them!' It was our good fortune to leave the streak when we did, for a little later one of the spy fishermen appeared. Charlie and I took up our accustomed places on the stringer piece, a little ahead of the streak, and over our own boat, where we could comfortably watch the Lancashire Queen. Nothing occurred till about nine o'clock, when we saw the two Italians leave the ship and pull along their side of the triangle toward the shore. Charlie looked as unconcerned as could be, but before they had covered a quarter of the distance, he whispered to me, Forty-five miles an hour. Nothing can save them. They're ours. Slowly the two men rode along till they were nearly in line with the windmill. This was the point where we always jumped into our salmon boat and got up the sail, and the two men, evidently expecting it, seemed surprised when we gave no sign. When they were directly in line with the windmill, as near to the shore as to the ship, and nearer to the shore than we had ever allowed them before, they grew suspicious. We followed them through the glasses and saw them standing up in the skiff and trying to find out what we were doing. The spy fisherman sitting beside us on the stringer piece was likewise puzzled. He could not understand our inactivity. The man in the skiff rowed nearer the shore, but stood up again and scanned it, as if they thought we might be in hiding there. But a man came out on the beach and waved a handkerchief to indicate that the coast was clear. That settled them. They bent to the oars to make a dash for it. Still Charlie waited. Not until they had covered three-quarters of the distance from the Lancashire Queen, which left them hardly more than a quarter of a mile to gain the shore, did Charlie slap me on the shoulder and cry, They're ours! They're ours! We ran the few steps to the side of the streak and jumped aboard. Stern and bow lines were cast off in a jiffy. The streak shot ahead and away from the wharf. The spy fisherman we had left behind on the stringer piece pulled out a revolver and fired five shots into the air in rapid succession. The men in the skiff gave instant heed to the warning, for we could see them pulling away like mad. But if they pulled like mad, I wonder how our progress can be described. We fairly flew. So frightful was the speed with which we displaced the water that a wave rose up on either side of our bow and foamed aft in a series of three stiff upstanding waves, while astern a great crested billow pursued us angrily as though at each moment it would fall aboard and destroy us. The streak was pulsing and vibrating and roaring like a thing alive. The wind of our progress was like a gale, a forty-five-mile gale. We could not face it and draw breath without choking and strangling. It blew the smoke straight back from the mouths of the smokestacks at a direct right angle to the perpendicular. In fact, we were traveling as fast as an express train. We just scraped it, was the way Charlie told it afterward. 
and I think his description comes nearer than any I can give. As for the Italians in the skiff, hardly had we started, it seemed to me, when we were on top of them. Naturally, we had to slow down long before we got to them, but even then we shot past like a whirlwind, and were compelled to circle back between them and the shore. They had rowed steadily, rising from the thwarts at every stroke, up to the moment we passed them. Then they recognized Charlie and me. That took the last bit of fight out of them. They hauled in their oars, and sullenly submitted to arrest. "'Well, Charlie,' Neil Partington said, as we discussed it on the wharf afterward, "'I fail to see where your boasted imagination came in to play this time.' But Charlie was true to his hobby. "'Imagination?' he demanded, pointing to the streak. "'Look at that. Just look at it. If the invention of that isn't imagination, I should like to know what is.' "'Of course,' he added. "'It's the other fellow's imagination, but it did the work all the same.' End of section four. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com.